Hi, this is Nursing A. Today we're going to discuss cholecystitis and pancreatitis, some key concepts in biliary and pancreatic disorders. Your gallbladder is a sac that stores the bile created by your liver. When you eat, it contracts and squeezes bile into the common bile duct and then that empties into the duodenum. The bile acids and salts help to digest food. Cholecystitis is an inflammation of the gallbladder. It can be acalculous, meaning without stones, such as biliary stasis, or it can contain stones or be called calculus, and that would be cholelithiasis. So cholelithiasis, lith meaning stones, is the word for gallstones. And these stones can be made of things like cholesterol, bilirubin, or a mix of the two. Stones can also form in the common bile duct, even if you don't have a gallbladder. So people who had significant gallstone disease oftentimes will form stones in the common bile duct after gallbladder removal, and this is called cholidocholithiasis. In cholecystitis, again, inflammation of the gallbladder, here seen packed full of stones, the patient oftentimes reports right upper quadrant pain and what we refer to as a Murphy's sign. And this is also called inspiratory arrest. Pressing your hand in the upper epigastric area and kind of pushing up and underneath the ribs on the patient's right side, you want to have the patient kind of relax and exhale as much as they can and get your hands underneath the rib cage if you can and have them take a deep breath in and they'll kind of catch their breath like a like they can't take a deep breath in and so again inspiratory arrest like they uh, catch their breath like ouch that hurts and that's referred to as a positive murphy sign and that's um, suggestive of a gallbladder issue Additional findings are colicky, intermittent, sharp pain in that kind of upper epigastric or right upper quadrant area. It usually radiates through to the back and sometimes up to um, the shoulder a little bit. Jaundice is possible, but less common than with uh, obstruction of um, like you know, the liver. And signs and symptoms often mimic cardiac pain. So the most important thing is to rule out an MI, which would be life-threatening, and that would be done with an EKG and a troponin or lab work, and then to work the patient up for cholecystitis. Diagnosis is done through things like um, abdominal and chest x-rays, ultrasound of the gallbladder, the pancreas, the liver, HIDA scans, and an ERCP. Lab work that's important to us when we're dealing with cholecystitis would be a CBC to look for evidence of infection, um, liver function tests to look for evidence of obstruction, and a bilirubin to look for, again, evidence of obstruction. The treatment of cholecystitis includes making the patient NPO, so decreasing the need for the gallbladder to contract helps decrease the pain, IV fluids to keep them hydrated and replacing any electrolytes that might be um, deficient, pain management is really important, as well as antibiotics. It's important to note that because of the histamine release, morphine may actually cause increased spasms and increased pain in patients with cholecystitis. And so other drugs like fentanyl or Dilaudid are often used, but opioids are still the drug of choice. 
If the patient has uh, cholecystitis and they're at home, so let's say we're managing them as an outpatient, it would be important for them to be instructed to avoid fatty foods and alcohol or things that irritate the gallbladder or cause it to spasm more. But in reality, the gallbladder does respond to almost all foods, even just water, and so people may continue to have pain even with just a significant change in their diet to a healthier one. Removal of the gallbladder, so a cholecystectomy could be done either open or laparoscopically. An open cholecystectomy often results in the placement of what's called a T-tube, and then a lap chole or a laparoscopic cholecystectomy usually does not have a T-tube placed. So this is a picture of a T-tube, it's shaped like a T, and the uh, top of the T is placed in the common bile duct, so it kind of stents or holds um, that area open and um, drains fluid, the uh, biliary fluids of the bile, out into a gravity drainage bag. So what color would you expect the drainage collecting in that bag to be. So look here very closely. You can see that the bag itself is stained a yellow color. And you might recognize that yellow color as the same color that people get when they have um, jaundice, right? So that's from excess bilirubin in the bloodstream. But when we're draining the bile out of the T-tube, we would expect that same color. So the staining that occurs, and trust me, this stains everything, um, like yellow food coloring, is yellow, but where it collects is a much darker kind of brown color. When we're draining like this from the T-tube, we also would expect the patient to have lighter color stools because the bile is not making it into the GI tract. So let's move on and talk about the pancreas. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. It can be either acute or chronic. Acute pancreatitis usually occurs as a result of exposure to alcohol, gallstones that obstruct the common bile duct, or trauma to the pancreas. The patient will present with left upper quadrant and epigastric pain versus the cholecystitis, which was on the right. This oftentimes radiates to the back and up to the shoulder. And the person experiences deep, sharp uh, pain that increases after eating. Nausea, vomiting, and anorexia or a loss of appetite are common, as well as abdominal fullness, hiccups, indigestion, fever, tachycardia, and hypotension. Keep in mind where the pancreas is and the fact that if it gets inflamed because it's so close to the diaphragm, it can actually kind of trigger that phrenic nerve, right? So that would give you the hiccups and the pain that radiates through kind of on the diaphragm to the back, and then as well as up that phrenic nerve to the shoulder on that left-hand side. So when you think about the A and P of the location, the radiation of the pain just makes sense. Acute pancreatitis can be a pretty significant problem versus, you know, acute um, cholecystitis, the gallbladder uh, disease or stones, the inflammation uh, typically tends to be painful, but unless it abscesses or ruptures, patients usually are just uncomfortable rather than really ill. With acute pancreatitis, patients can become 
really ill. So you'll notice that there's more lab work that we monitor. The amylase and lipase are pancreatic enzymes that we keep an eye on. The BUN tells us about the hydration status of the patient. White blood cells would signal that there was an infection or inflammation. Liver function tests would be elevated if there was an obstruction or gallstone pancreatitis from a common bile duct obstruction. Glucose is elevated because of irritation of the pancreas. And then um, we also can get calcium, uh, hypocalcemia, so we can get calcium imbalances. And this is due to fat necrosis and loss of albumin and malnutrition, which are most common in alcoholic pancreatitis. Um, but you, when you see this, remember Chavostex and Trousseau sign, the numbness and tingling, kind of the hyperreflexia, twitching kind of things. That's pretty significant. Diagnosis of acute pancreatitis can uh, include ultrasound, CAT scan, and MRI. One of the complications that we're monitoring for with acute pancreatitis is intra-abdominal hemorrhage. It can be either periumbilical, which is Cullen's sign, and the way I remember these is Cullen's is like circumferential or a circle around the abdomen, um, so it's kind of in the center, so put the C's together, and Gray Turner's sign is like flank or retroperitoneal bruising, and so you have to turn them to see it. Um, so that's how I remember the difference between Cullen's, which is kind of um, in the center, and Gray Turner's, which is more like you have to turn them or look at their flanks to see them. Both of these, again, though, are just signs of intra-abdominal hemorrhage. So you're looking for this ecchymosis that can't be explained by injections or that wasn't there um, on the last exam, certainly can't be explained by like procedures or surgery. So the management of acute pancreatitis, again, um, NPO, NG tube, parenteral feeding, which would be uh, TPN or PPN, um, to let the gut rest, so to stop uh, anything that stimulates the pancreas from needing to secrete. IV fluids are really important. And pain medications, so opioid narcotics, again, morphine can be used, fentanyl, uh, Dilaudid, any of those are fine. Antibiotics really are only used if the patient has necrosis. If they don't have a necrotic area, antibiotics are not going to help with pancreatitis because uh, pancreatitis is usually um, like a chemical inflammatory problem and not an infectious inflammatory problem. And then surgery can be performed and that's called a sphincterotomy where they can actually go in and open up the sphincters to allow for easier drainage. So opioid narcotics, again, morphine, sulfate for pain, anticholinergic agents like um, atropine or uh, glycopyrrolate decrease intestinal motility and decrease pancreatic enzyme release. Spasm, um, spasmolytics, I wanted to add an extra syllable in there, relax smooth muscle and relax the sphincter of ODI to help with uh, draining. The H2 blockers and PPIs help decrease gastric acid secretions and will decrease like gastritis and irritation. Pancreatic enzymes can actually be administered to help digest fats and proteins and can be taken with meals if the patient is not NPO. Antibiotics are used for acute necrotizing pancreatitis. And then octreotide, which we talked about with the um, esophageal varices, can also be used because it decreases the secretion of enzymes, those gastric enzymes, um, and helps allow the pancreas to rest. So three complications that we monitor for for the patient with acute pancreatitis would include necrotizing pancreatitis, 
where auto digestion leads to the creation of gas gangrene, which can be seen on CAT scan. This can easily become infected and leads to sepsis and MODS. And surgically, it could be resected, so it's called a necrosectomy, which they remove just the necrosed part. Hemorrhage can occur, intra-abdominal hemorrhage, and again, Cullen's is in the center of the abdomen and gray turner, you have to turn them to look at the flank. Um, so if you see ecchymosis or you know bruising, discoloration in those areas, you would think intra-abdominal hemorrhage. Hemorrhagic shock presents as it normally would, pale, cool, clammy skin, restlessness, anxiety, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension. And a pseudocyst can form, and this is from enzymatic juices. Um, it may resolve on its own. It may need to be drained. And if it gets infected, this would be one of the times where we would use antibiotics. So sometimes acute pancreatitis uh, can become chronic pancreatitis and other conditions can also lead to the development of chronic pancreatitis. And these would include, um, you know, obstructions of the common bile duct, um, pancreatic duct obstructions, uh, cysts, and uh, prolonged ischemia. So chronic pancreatitis presents with chronic inflammation and scarring of the pancreas. And this leads to problems with the digestion of proteins and fats and problems with the glucose balance because the, the pancreas is responsible for the release of insulin and glucagon as well as for the release of those digestive juices. The patient with chronic pancreatitis typically experiences weight loss, chronic left upper quadrant pain, and it gets worse after alcohol intake and fatty food, just like acute pancreatitis. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, clay colored stools, and steatorrhea, or the fatty stools, are common with chronic pancreatitis. Diagnoses of chronic pancreatitis can be made through ultrasound, CAT scan, ERCP, as well as a good history. Amylase and lipase, again, would be elevated because they're pancreatic enzymes. Alkaline phosphatase is elevated. Bilirubin and glucose are both elevated with chronic pancreatitis. The treatment management includes pain management, and monitoring fluid and electrolyte balance, enzyme replacement, and if it's severe, we would do TPN to allow the pancreas to rest. Surgical removal of the pancreas is palliative, and at that point in time, then, the patient would need daily insulin injections as if they had diabetes, as well as pancreatic enzyme replacements. Pancreatic cancer can also occur. Typically, similar to the liver, this has a very vague kind of insidious onset and is often malignant prior to diagnosis. Therefore, it has a very high mortality rate and in later stages, the patient experiences pain, weight loss, and jaundice. Management of pancreatic cancer includes chemotherapy and radiation, and then what's called the Whipple's procedure. So if the cancer is in the head of the pancreas, the head of the pancreas is removed, and then the neck of the pancreas is attached to the small intestine. As you can see, that's detached at um, the pylorus from the stomach and moved up and attached directly to the, pan the pancreas. And then the stomach then is attached further down on the small intestine. So this is called Whipple's procedure. 
In the operating room, an NG tube is placed for decompression. It will be hooked to suction. Do not clamp this tube. Do not insert or flush anything through it. Do not attempt to feed or pass meds through that NG tube. It should not be repositioned. If the output decreases, notify the physician. If any abdominal distension or discomfort occurs, notify the physician. Anything that um, impedes successful decompression of the abdomen after this procedure could put stress on the sutures and cause rupture of the suture lines. And then that would lead to like intra-abdominal hemorrhage and dumping of the gastric acids from the stomach into the abdomen. Okay, so let's review. In the right upper quadrant, we have the liver and the gallbladder, and in the left upper quadrant, the pancreas. Where the pain refers to depends on the location of the organ involved. So right upper quadrant pain tends to refer more to the back or kind of behind the shoulder blade, whereas left upper quadrant pain tends to refer to the back and then up to the top of the shoulder or even the front of the shoulder. In order to rest the organs of digestion, the pancreas and the gallbladder, the patient needs to be NPO. IV fluids then are important to replace what they're not getting by oral intake, and pain management is really critical because both pancreatitis and cholecystitis are very painful conditions. Teach patients to avoid alcohol and fatty foods or any of the triggers that they have for their condition. And then critical thinking is also really important here. So if you know that there are complications that can occur, you wanna be watching for those. Always be thinking two steps kind of ahead of the current presentation. What could go wrong and what am I looking for? Hemorrhage and shock. So evidence of pale, cool, clammy skin, restlessness, anxiety, tachypnea, tachycardia, hypotension looking for the Cullens and the Gray Turner sign. All of those are really important to assess for hemorrhage. Assess for any evidence of a leaking anastomosis after surgery or infection or sepsis. And look for fluid and electrolyte imbalances, not just in your labs, but also in your clinical presentation. So look for the evidence of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia or hypocalcemia or whatever it may be, it's important that you clinically correlate what you're seeing in the lab work. As always, thank you for watching and um, please leave us a comment about where you're watching from. Take care.